Next, Ron Moen. Ron is a statistician, consultant, and teacher in industry, government, healthcare, and education. He's co-founder and partner in Associates in Process Improvement and adjunct lecturer in the Physics and Engineering Science Department at the University of Michigan Flint in 19, from 1995 to 2005. His experiences of over 30 years include General Motors Corporation and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He served as a Deming helper in over 70 of his four-day seminars between 1983 and 1993. He's a senior fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, since 1998, and that was what Don Berwick headed up before he went into government, and served as an improvement advisor for various collaboratives and idealized design project, as well as a member of the faculty for the IA Professional Development Program. He's a member of the board of directors at Peaker Services, which is Dick Steele's company, and Genesis uh, Health System. He was also a member of the Deming Institute Board of Trustees from 1994 to 97 and has remained on the advisory board. Um, Ron has written several books. I know I've seen some of them floating around here, The Improvement Guide, second edition, and also a new one, The Quality Improvement Through Planned Experimentation, third edition. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Ron and let him take it away on our next session. Thank you. So let me see if you're paying attention last night. Why are we here? <laughs> Fun? Learn. To learn and to make a difference. Right. I would suggest that become your triple aim from this day forward. It might change your life. Really powerful. Every seminar he started with that. First it was those first two, but then making a difference was near the end. I wasn't sure having fun and learning was enough. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to actually tell a story this morning. Uh, and it's a story about a request that Dr. Deming made to me in, in 1982. And he said, uh, Ron, you must write a, a book, a statistics books on analytic studies. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, prediction is the problem. So I'm going to give you a 30-year journey of his request and how it has evolved up to today. <clears throat> so actually, before it starts, I might say that uh, I actually grew up on a farm in Iowa here uh, a long time ago. And um, that's not exactly where uh, authors come from or writers come from. So I majored in math. And the only reason I majored in math was I could not write. Uh, so I ruled everything out with writing, and so I ended up in mathematics. Uh, so that was kind of the start of my uh, writing career. Uh, in graduate school, then, I studied statistics and probability. And uh, you know, I learned a lot of things. Uh, there's one of my teachers, t-test, f-test, chi-squared, goodness fit, all these nice words, a normal distribution. My mantra was statistically significant at the O5 level. That was it. I even studied sampling theory uh, out of Dr. Deming's book. Uh, so I learned how to sample a population and make inferences back. And uh, wow, I was, I was supreme. The statistician could really contribute to the world. In uh, 1972, I joined the Department of Agriculture, thinking I could change the world. After about six months, I had yet to see a population to sample. It seemed like just they didn't exist. I think I needed my money back. Uh, but I did work with some great people, Tom Nolan and, and Lloyd Provost uh, at USDA. Uh, and we spent many hours studying uh, papers, especially Dr. Deming's paper from 1975. You probably <coughs> haven't read it, but it's on probability as a basis for action. And it actually dealt with analytic studies. And the thing that we really thought was funny was the example uh, from the University of Wyoming uh, from the Department of Animal Husbandry, who made this astounding scientific discovery of fibers on the left side of the sheep and those on the right side are of different diameter. That must be what it looked like. <laughs> um, and of course, the sample size was 50,000. 50,000. Anything would be significant. 
1980, uh, Ford and GM hired Dr. Deming after uh, viewing the uh, NBC white paper of Japan Can, Why Can't We? And uh, he asked the, both companies to hire a statistician. And I guess I would call that an interpreter. Uh, there was kind of a different language going on, and so our job, my job, was to help in the language between GM and Dr. Deming. So Bill Schergenbach took that job in 1982, as we heard last night. I took the job. Uh, he did it for Ford. I did it for GM. And uh, we were interpreters. Uh, we've had many re uh, interactions with Deming since then. Uh, but over and over again, almost every month, he'd say, Ron, how is that book coming? Ron, how is that book coming? And I said, fine. I still didn't know what he's talking about. Uh, but I did learn in one of his seminars that the most important college was theory of knowledge. And he said, everybody just had that course, right? No. <laughs> no, I didn't have that course. Uh, so I was beginning to think I was a little bit on shaky ground. Um, I was not sure anymore. So in November of 1982, I was able to travel with Dr. Deming and Diana Cahill, uh, to visit the uh, Deming Prize ceremony with Dr. Deming. And uh, so we attended that ceremony on November 18th. Uh, Diana and I, were, we were back in here along with Nancy Mann. Uh, it was quite a ceremony. I thought surely I would learn something about prediction. Surely I would learn something about prediction. A whole week with him. And uh, I followed him around, and this is the closest we got to it right there. I, maybe Diana, where's Diana, you remember that? Uh, the, the great Buddha of Kanahara, giving him inspiration, it didn't help me any. Um, but I did get to see another side of Deming. Uh, in 1983, I think one of the pictures Bill showed last night was of the statisticians. He actually had all the great statisticians from around the world come to Ford. So uh, I was lucky enough to go to that, and so I got to hear really what the statisticians were thinking about analytic studies because really he didn't, Bill didn't mention that last night, but the topic was analytic studies. And all these statisticians didn't know what he was talking about either. Had no clue what he was talking about. Um, so I ended up drawing a picture. I guess it was a mind map. And this isn't really the actual picture, but this is sort of what it reminded me of right there. I, uh, studied in graduate school enumerative problems, but they really didn't relate to the real world. And I think what, I had a chain around my neck and everybody else defended enumerative studies. That's kind of the meeting that was, including George Box, by the way. Um, so what I did learn though was I think there's two kinds of problems. Uh, one is the enumerative problem, which is sampling a population, like taking a sample from a pond. And, but the real problem was more like sampling from a river the river that's ever changing. And I think that is sort of lies where statisticians break down. They just don't see the river. They make everything a pond. They make everything a pond. So in 1984, I recruited Tom Nolan and Lloyd Provost to help on the journey of the book. So we had a big celebration. We were pretty excited. We actually, we all attended that conference. So we began to think we could actually make a contribution and really contribute to what Dr. Deming requested me to do. So we celebrated, there they are, we're celebrating. Um, and then in 1986, uh, Tom Nolan and I wrote a paper, which we sent to Dr. Deming, and it was really the beginning of using the uh, Schuhart cycle for learning improvement, which wasn't called the PDSA back then in 86. And uh, so Lloyd, uh, uh, Tom and I wrote this paper and uh, Dr. Deming says, the paper is great, I think. I hope you're pushing on the book. So this, again, was pushing on the book. Best regards, Dr. Deming. What I learned, though, was that the Schuart cycle needed to have prediction built into it, which, which makes it live right inside the theory of knowledge. So we needed to make predictions in our plan. Planning requires prediction. Prediction requires a theory. In fact, that became my, my new mantra. Planning requires prediction. Prediction requires a theory. So we really worked hard at that. And then here's another example. Where I, I think the Schuart cycle is getting closer to the form we have it now. 
And this was at a four-day seminar, and he says, Ron, I'd appreciate your help on the short cycle. I will explain it, it at 9 o'clock, then you run through it in your own way. Is that good? So there was a chance to pilot among 600 people. You know, first he <laughs> gave it, and I gave it. So uh, I learned a lot from that. Um, and so it really became the PDSA, the Plan, Do, Study, Act, which, again, tied in with the planning part and the study part had to be connected, deductive, inductive. So this, is really, this really made it live in the theory of knowledge. Now, Dem Deming's version didn't really go this explicit, but we thought it was important. We've been doing it ever since, that in the planning, you make your predictions based on your plan. And then when you get to the study, you determine whether or not your predictions come true. You compare the data from the, to the predictions. That's how you learn. That's right out of theory of knowledge. Uh, in um, 1990, I sent him the first five chapters of the book. So 82 to 90, it took me that long, first five chapters. He says, I don't recall the content of your book, <laughs> which I'm delighted that it's in its final stages. But here's his warning. If it speaks of the PDSA, be sure and call it the PDSA and not that corruption PDCA. Whoa. Fortunately, I didn't have PDCA. Uh, so there's a big mess of understanding about PDCA. Uh, now, at this, then he took the, um, the five chapters and he wrote a foreword. And this is the foreword. I don't know if you can read it, but I do have a copy at the end of the morning session. You can pick up your copy. This became my North Star to write the book. This became my North Star. And I've sort of highlighted the idea of prediction in there. And even though my book probably wasn't close to this that he read, uh, this was the North Star. The problem of prediction. Uh, and then the answer is predict, predict whether one or of the methods or materials tested will in the future, under a specified range of conditions, perform better than the other. Prediction is the problem. And then later on in that Next paragraph, significance or the lack of it provides no degree of belief, high, moderate, or low about prediction of performance in the future, in the future, which is only reason to carry out comparison of tests and so on. So again, if you think of the pond, the pond, you can really estimate what's in the pond. So the major source of uncertainty is sampling error. But the major source of uncertainty in a prediction in the future is just that. It cannot be quantified. You cannot quantify it. So how could you write a book, statistics book, that would cover that? So this became a, my North Star, and it haunts me ever to today. Um, so at the same time I was doing this, Deming was working on a system of profound knowledge. And of course, Mike Twighty talked about that in uh, uh, Deming 101 yesterday morning, uh, the evolution of the system of profound knowledge. And this is a, a paper that he usually that he used for his North Star, well, it's his working paper, I should say. And it's called Foundation for Management for, of Quality in the Western World. This was handed out at the four-day seminars. This was before the New Economics was out. And I highlighted that the very bottom of that, uh, that was presented at um, Osaka in July of 1989. And noticed in red, comments and help appreciated. Comments and help appreciated. Well, there was help, and actually it was from the University of Minnesota. Uh, three authors took that paper, and they sort of put it together into a, their kind of exploring what that was really saying. Uh, this was on May 21, 22, 1990. They listed what Deming was calling profound knowledge, uh, and you see these listed here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. He just made this big list. It was actually more than 14 points now. It was really all these different principles or elements. And so I use those elements to write the book. Knowledge about statistical concepts of variation. Knowledge about losses from tampering. Knowledge of procedures aimed at minimum net or economic loss. Uh, basically, um, uh, Schuhart's concept. Knowledge about interaction of forces. I needed something about testing interactions. Plant experimentation did that. Taguchi loss function. We heard from uh, Bill Bellows yesterday, the Taguchi loss function. It was loss to society. Uh, when I studied the Taguchi book, when I saw loss to society, uh, 
his next sentence in that book was, called, was that the actions you take, if there's a loss to society, if you fail to, uh, to reach the target or move towards a target, the loss is greater than the actions of a thief. I'll never forget that. It's a loss to society. A thief doesn't, there's not loss to society. I take your money. That's not loss to society. There's still the money. This was worse than that. Loss to society. Of course, when everybody looked at the Gucci loss function, they put the loss of the customer there. It was society. Very important. So these, this was my checklist that I used to write the book that I thought was really important. That's the first part. And then knowledge about the theory of extreme values, knowledge about statistical theory of failure. And so I really needed to bring a lot of Taguchi ideas in here as well, especially robust design. Uh, almost two-thirds of the ideas were around that. Well, this paper then from University of Minnesota, Deming was not at that conference, I was, uh, but they put together then, they said this is, you know, if you really look at this, these go in four buckets. These go in four buckets. So these are the buckets they ended up with. This is 1990. Cognitive psychology, organizational theory and behavior, Statistical theory and systems theory. Okay? All of them fit underneath those four buckets. Well, within three months, in September 1990, guess what Deming did? He's a fast learner. Look at page 11. Uh, he has now has four buckets. Not the same ones as the University of Minnesota, but I'm, and I did not talk to him about this, but I'm convinced that this is... This triggered him to really put it together. We've got to look at it in a, a broader context and then put ideas around it. So here are his four points. So I would say he was a fast learner. He listened to uh, the response and the comments. Uh, so his book uh, really became the New Economics uh, three years later. So six years later, uh, now I'm ready to publish the first book. So um, there it is, 1991. Um, so that was uh, an attempt to do this, and actually it had quite a few good things in it. I had control charts at the very beginning, uh, which I thought was important. Uh, I talked about the enumerative analytic studies. I went all the way back to uh, uh, Sir Ronald Fisher, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but um, his book came out in 93, and there it is, uh, which by the way, the second edition came out after he died. Uh, we took Seal's notes and did the second edition, put everything, all the notes uh, from, the, uh, from the last six months of his life and put it in the second edition. Uh, and then it took six more years before I wrote the second edition. So now the feedback was, why in the world can you have experimental design and have control charts in the beginning? So we put them at the end. We put them in appendix. So we changed that. Uh, which I think was a mistake. But we did do one good thing about enumerative and analytic. Uh, we changed it from sort of a, um, a dichotomy for classifying problems in enumerative and analytic into more of a continuum. So the left-hand column is the continuum, with the top being estimation at the bottom being prediction. The next two columns represent then the, the, the uh, statistical knowledge required and then subject matter knowledge required. And if you look at those two columns and look at the examples there, starting with acceptance sampling, census, and so on, uh, down through prototyping, and, and so on, uh, you'll see that at the top, statistics plays a major role. But soon, it dies out. And all you can do is use statistics to support the learning of subject matter knowledge. That was a breakthrough in the book. But we were always trying to use statistics to enhance the subject matter knowledge. That was the key. I think we're getting closer. So it took a, a few more years. Uh, but in, nine, in 2012, which again is nine more years, uh, we published the book. And McGraw-Hill wanted it published in 2011. But uh, Tom Lloyd and I said, uh, we're not going to go with the numerical goal. We're going to wait till we, uh, we have it we think is pretty good. So it came a year later in 2012. Uh, so this is where we're at. Um, as of uh, June, and of course now I'm working on my next version of this book because we still haven't reached it. We still have the North Star, uh, which you'll see a copy of the forward. We put the forward in every one because that's really where, where we're headed. 
Uh, we don't know uh, exactly what it's going to contain, but back in 1990, Dr. Deming said this book should be called Sequential Experimentation for Quality. It never got to that, but the next edition will be called that. Um, so we're still working on it. So that's kind of my story of writing a book for Dr. Deming. So I do think the Deming Institute and uh, as a challenge for us here is to really support the mission of the Deming Institute, and that's really the, the, uh, the uh, fostering understanding of the Deming system of profound knowledge. So I'm going to give you an assignment, my request to you, uh, and that is the following. This is each one of you here. You must write a book on profound knowledge. <laughs> you must write a book on profound knowledge. And in fact, I'll, I'll write the, the forward for you right now. <laughs> All right? It's chapter four of the New Economics. All right. That's the forward, but you have to write the book. And I'll start pushing you on this book. <laughs> I have your emails. <laughs> <laughs> we all need it. Prediction is the problem. So uh, now what I'm going to do is, I was so inspired to be at Iowa State, the campus, that uh, th yesterday I put together a, um, a little activity. So um, being on campus, I have a quiz. So everybody has to take the quiz, not only the students, but all of you. So I had a pretty good time with this quiz. So are we ready? It's a true-false quiz. <coughs> now if you heard Bill Bellows talk about... Um, Instead of just true and false, what would be a third option? It depends. Right? It depends, right? Now, D Dr. Deming's version of that would be a little bit different. He would say, under what conditions is it true, and under what conditions is it not true? All right? And that would take some learning. But I have to have the grades in by noon, so we're going to have to just do true and false. All right, so we're gonna, here's the first question. So you're going to pay attention, and it's true or false. Um, I have to read this. In Amsterdam, a tile under the syphilis urinals would pass inspection in an operating room, but nobody noticed that what everybody does notice is that each urinal has a fly in it. Follow that? Can you see it? So, the fly in the urinal will reduce spillage by 80%. True or false? <laughs> no, just wait, 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 wait. I, now, one of the tools I learned one of the seven basic tools of Japan uh, is called stratification. Most people don't even know that. So I'm going to stratify the population. So I want all the men to stand up first. <laughs> all right. Now, raise your hand if it's true. All right, sit down. 95% of the men said it's true. Now I want all the women to stand up. Raise your hand if it's true. Oh my gosh, 7%. Wow. Wow, thank you. That's stratification. Now you see what would happen if we'd put all of you together? Totally different response. So stratification is very powerful for understanding variation. Um, now the answer is true. Look harder, the fly it turns out on the black outline is sketched in the porcelain. It, it improves the aim. If a man sees a fly, he aims at it. Fly and urinal research, fly and urinal research found that etchings reduce spillage by 80%. It gives a guy something to think about. <laughs> so, uh, So I showed this slide in uh, Vancouver, and um, a coach for uh, eighth grade boys um, hockey said, oh yeah, we put, we put um, Cheerios in the urinals. And he said, it works. So it works on children as well, male children. All right. <laughs> now actually, I use this as a good example of one of the uh, 72 change concepts that API put together in the improvement guide, and it's actually number 62, affordance. So it's really a good example of that, where you, you, you provide insight without need for explanation into how a task should be done. It's that simple. All right, we're ready for another one? 
Question number two. <coughs> you see what happened here? Yep. We have a, an event. The car went off. It's in the water. And so we have to remove it with a crane. All right, so here's the question. The vehicle be, will be removed from the water and placed on the dock. True or false? Raise your hand if you think it's true. <laughs> uh, just true or false? I have to turn my grades in here. I'm 30. Um, all right, well, you're right. It's false. <laughs> It's false. <laughs> Look at the guy ducking there. Yeah. <laughs> this is a two-part question. So you said it's false. So whatever your prediction requires a, a theory, uh, you better re revise your theory now. Um, so uh, anyway, here we go. So here we go. Guess what? <laughs> All right, so the theory is a bigger crane, obviously. Look at that, picking him right up. So here's your question. The vehicle will be removed from the water and placed on the dock. True or false? What's your theory? A bigger crane? You see, from, from the theory of knowledge, a single observation will require you to revise your theory. A single observation. That's from theory of knowledge. This is real. This is real, yeah. All right, and this reminds me of actually one of the stories Deming told of Chanticleer, a barnyard rooster who crowed every morning and the sun came up. So he, his theory was clear. The crowing made the sun come up. But what happened? He overslept one morning. And the sun came up anyway. The story, he had to revise his theory. He no longer caused the sun to come up. Story of Chanticleer. All right, here's one for Iowa. Uh, get ready for a wild, wet, wild winter in 2012. Ready? Iowans? Iowa will have a wet, wild winter in 2012. True or false? Raise your hand if it's true, if you think it's true. This is for Iowa now. <clears throat> well, I had to get evidence. And again, it is a prediction. So what's my theory? I actually, uh, having grown up in Iowa, I do think it's true. Because the theory is the farmer's almanac. And every farmer knows that they can predict the weather with pretty good accuracy. So what's the message here? What's a good theory? Dr. Deming uh, would, was asked that question once, and he said, one that predicts over time. A good theory is one that predicts over time, like gravity. A good theory predicts. predicts over time. So I think the Farmer's Almanac still is a good predictor. How about this one? Next question. There's a prediction for the stock market crash in 2013, if not sooner. His theory was the planets will align. And what do you think? The stock market will crash in 2013, if not sooner. True or false? Anybody think it's true? <laughs> See, we do. I'd suggest we sell our stocks tomorrow. <laughs> well, I have evidence. There they are. The planets are aligned. So uh, it's obviously true. I have evidence, right? So what is this? Well, this, uh, the, this might be an example of um, confirmation trap out of psychology. It's so easy to find evidence to support your theory. So easy to find evidence. A really powerful lesson from psychology. Confirmation trap. It happens everywhere. I work a lot with doctors. Their diagnosis is totally they misdiagnosed because they think they know what it is. So they look for evidence. They see my planet right here. Here's your problem, Ron. Uh, so there's another lesson. Confirmation trap from theory of knowledge. Here's another one. The uh, huge recall by Ford Motor Company, 421,000 escapes. 
Uh, one of the biggest ones. All right, 2001 to 2004. Sure, surely they've learned for the new model. <clears throat> Ford has asked drivers of the new 2013 Escape to stop driving them. Stop driving them. True or false? True. There's the evidence. If you believe media, it is true. Uh, several of them were at causing fires, and they stopped drop driving them. They did fix the problem. All right. So again, I, I don't know what the lesson is here, but be careful about what you read. You can probably read anything. Confirmation trap might be there, but I do think this was true, having, uh, now that I live in Michigan. How about this one, Toyota? Toyota has 23 different models of the two, their 2012 vehicle recall. True or false? Raise your hand if true. Do you have Toyotas? Hmm. <laughs> there they are. This is in the US only, 23 different models, true. 23 different models, all true. All right, well, we're on the campus of Iowa State University, uh, Snedeker and Cochran's famous book. This is not their book, by the way. Um, this is the cult of statistical significance, si significance, how the standard error causes jobs, justice, and lives. Question. This is not a published book available for purchase, true or false? Now it's true. It's a very popular book. Uh, came out two years ago. There you can buy it, right there. Uh, Amazon.com for how much? About $88. And there's 17 reviews. You ought to read the reviews. People, the statisticians are hanging on to their, their enumerative study theory. They're hanging on. Otherwise, they won't have a job. This really shows the, the error in the thinking. It's the first book that I actually have seen where Deming's message to me in 1980, someone else really grabbed it and ran with it. Uh, so you might want to consider reading that. Now, I have actually two questions left for extra credit. So these are true false questions. Hmm. We don't have the, uh, the debate from last week. There's another one this week. But I guess I'm looking at blue with a head. So by the way, this is pretty good. The enumerative problem, to be a statistician, I would say you do the survey, say if the election were held today, putting us back in the pond, here would be the standard error. But that doesn't mean anything. The only thing that counts is what's going to happen on election day. Uh, so my only question on this is, uh, Prediction is the problem, true or false? True. true. Right, absolutely. And then here's a tough one. There it is. There's more evidence. This was uh, September 20th, uh, watching our uh, ice melt, <laughs> North Pole, global warming. A lot of discussion about that. A lot of data is misused, misunderstood. But my only question to you is, Prediction is the problem for global warming, true or false? True. All right, I'll be having these uh, graded within the hour because the computer is doing it. And um, I think you did pretty well. Thank you very much. Prediction is the problem. Thank you. So again, uh, you can have one of these, uh, and you already have the forward for your assignment, uh, the new economics, so uh, I would like to uh, keep you working on that. Kevin? Yeah, question? Yeah. Okay. Yes? How many words did I look at? You stop when you have, no longer have a passion. Stop. Yes. Ron, can you talk a little bit about I I and why Berwick never got confirmed? In, I mean, it was I'll back up more than that. Uh, one of the seminars, uh, I think Tom Nolan and I helped him, uh, uh, Dr. Deming, with a seminar. It was in Washington, D.C., and I think it was 1984. Um, or 80, I think it was 85. Don Berwick attended the seminar, day one. At the end of day one, 
he flew back to Boston. He said, I can't listen to this old guy for three more days. And by the way, that happened a lot. A lot of, not a lot, but I'd say maybe 5%. This is not what I expected. Not what I expected at all. So he flew home, back to Boston, back to Cambridge, um, and um, he went to bed that night, and he couldn't sleep. He was up all night. He got on a plane and flew back to Washington and attended the next three days and uh, has been the D Deming disciple, or I should say the Dr. Deming of healthcare ever since. Um, so he started IHI. Uh, again, the, he's done great things, uh, talking about saving lives. They had a campaign saving 100,000 lives. By the way, uh, uh, J.W. Wilson was correct about the hospitals are killing people. Uh, it's probably up to close to 200,000 a year from uh, uh, various um, issues, one being adverse drug events, uh, another being uh, uh, surgical site infections, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really not rocket science. <clears throat> uh, even the surgical site, uh, one of the uh, tools with a checklist for surgeons to make sure that they, everything is in place before they do the surgery, that's saving lives. A checklist, a simple thing is checklist. One of the questions to the surgeon was, can you name all the people around you at the surgery ta at the table? Very important question. Can you name them? You'd be surprised how important that was. So Dr. Uh, Berwick actually had a 100,000 lives campaign. And, and in 18 months, they saved 143,000 lives in the US. One of the projects I worked on with him in Ghana was the Five Alive. That saved thousands and thousands of children. I have projects right now, my, some of my students with IHI uh, on HIV in South Africa, thousands of lives. So he is an amazing person. He is the doctor, Dr. Deming of healthcare. And uh, Obama appointed him during the recess, uh, put him in head of CMS, which is 800 billion dollar budget, 200,000 employees. Uh, so he was appointed there, but it was clear that Congress was not going to approve him uh, because he was supported Obama. Right. So no one would really get approved, probably, at that point. Uh, so he was in there eight months, and in de December he had to step down. He is not working with IHI. He's just sort of pondering. He's not sure what he's going to be doing. So that's kind of the story of Don Berwick. But he'll be back. I'm glad he wrote the, uh, the forward for the book there. Yeah. Right. Very, very, very capable person. He started out by dropping out of the Deming Seminar. On the other end of the four-day seminars, about 10% of the people at the end of four days come up to Dr. Deming. And he's tired. And every time I would hear the same thing, you changed my life. You changed my life. Some of you may have said that to him. You changed my life. They shook his hand. OK, next question. Yes? Well, you know, I think the, uh, the, the whole theory of extreme values is another study for statisticians. He thought that was very important. So again, the whole idea is not to aggregate data, but keep it in its most purest form. Don't do averages, don't do summaries. Symmetric, symmetric statistics sort of wipe out some of the important things. <clears throat> so I, <clears throat> to me, the lesson was just keep the data in its rawest form. In our book here, we always plot all the data. One of the first things we do is to, we plot the data in the order that was, was generated. Time order plots, every one. So we could actually have, uh, we can run experimental designs where we don't have uh, stability. Uh, as long as we know that ahead of time, as long as we know that ahead of time and look for that. So uh, the whole idea is to, um, to try to make in changes and use the data to help decide if the change is an improvement. And he says any sort of aggregation, any, any sort of symmetric function, summary statistics, you lose the power of the information. You lose the power of the information. Now, it doesn't make any difference if it's the pond, but that time order plot, and if you see the, one of the last uh, words, the next to last paragraph, in contrast, interchange two points and a plot of points may make a big difference in the message 
that the data are trying to convey for prediction. Just change two points, and you say it, it will make a big difference. So I, I think that's a challenge for all of us that are studying statistics. Yes? So actually, I have a question about the data. Because you made lots of points in the book. It was used to end of deviation to control it. No, I don't use that. Um, well, we could to see if. Yeah, but remember, the Schuart's uh, control chart was used, is a passive tool. It's used to decide whether or not um, something's changed. So you really, if you think of a cause and effect diagram, the effects over here, the causes are here. The Schuart chart is looking at the uh, the date over time, and there's, if there's a signal of a special cause, which is the three sigma limits and the rules around special cause, then you look into the cause system. <clears throat> What, the way we did it, we reversed it. In our book, we have to look at the other way around. We have to work on the causes and see if we can create a special cause. So the sort of the control limits get in the way. No, 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 because it's it's an active role. We want it to change. We have to decide if the change is an improvement. That's part of the problem. But it's more you don't let the control limits decide for you. It's really subject matter knowledge. Well, if you see one, if you think you see one, you could put control limits on and say, what happened during my experiment? For example, I, I uh, kept uh, blood pressure, my, pers my personal blood pressure measurements for the last nine months. And so I was running an experiment with my doctor. He said, uh, you should use drug A. And then after two months, I showed him the data. And there was a couple of special causes. That was control charts. That was passive. So he said, let's run a, uh, uh, let's run a, uh, let, no, he, what he really said, he didn't say run a test. I think you need to switch, you need to add another drug, drug C. And he said, let's call it the one plus one equal three test. One plus one equal three. I said, okay, we'll do that. So uh, I took the two, two together. And of course, to, to me, that meant there will be an interaction, which will actually lower it more. So I collected the data. And while I'm doing that, I'm doing control charts. And yes, there were special causes. And I learned a lot from those. Uh, when, when there was anxiety, when I was um, stressed out, a lot of times on my travels around the world, the, the plane rides really are killers for your body. So those special causes were removed. And then I went back to him showing in the control charts and the special causes, I identified almost every one, because it it's my own system. Then I said, I want to run another test. We actually have a half of a two to the two already. Why don't we run um, drug C by itself? So I, A and A first, A and C second. Now I said, let's run C. And then, of course, I was thinking the fourth test, which was no A, no C. And he would have never proved that. So I went, and did, I went ahead and did it anyway. A month and a half of each, <laughs> right? And in the meantime, I'm actually identifying special causes. And there's one day that I could not, everyone I was identified, so that again is control charts. And there was one day where it was 100 over 60. And I never could explain it. I had no idea. But when I, for example, one day I was stuck in traffic. And uh, it's surprising how your blood pressure goes up when you're driving in rush hour, in Detroit at least, where they drive 80 in the left lane uh, and then stop. Uh, so I couldn't understand that. But all of that was passive, but I was learning from special causes, and I was improving my own system, basically. But then I put it all into the two to the two and looked at the variation uh, of the two to the two, which is all four combinations. And he was right. There was an interaction. But it was not better with A and C together. C was the key. C by itself, drug C, uh, which is chlorothiodide, anyway, the water pill. So that worked. Um, that was a two to the two. I also looked at it. Now I can look at it in experimental design. I also looked at the variation from, uh, from uh, day to day, which was the standard, using the standard deviation for the, the data in each of the four combinations. So it's, what the book is about is really a blend of um, Schuhart charts and experimental design. I think that's a perfect example of it. They come together. So in this version of the book, it, they really, it's integrated throughout. 
The other thing we put in the book, which actually the data that I have on my blood pressure fits in here nicely, I didn't use it, there's a chapter on where the response variable is time series data, which is exactly what I had for my blood pressure. I had blood pressure every morning at 8 o'clock, so I had a month and a half of data with one combination, A, and then with C, AC, and no AC. No. So uh, that's another chapter. And I don't think any books ever put that together before. That was the... Uh, Really, we worked hard at that, the ability to look at the data. And one of the plots we do, we also built the software to go with that. And the plot shows all the raw data. So I have six months worth of data. You can see A and C together. You can see A. You can see all four combinations laid out in, in a time series plot with the software. It works beautiful. So it's really a blending of those two together. Also, I will say one more thing. Looking at the data from a, a few more minutes. Uh, the last chapter is on uh, new product development. And when I look at these recalls, I keep saying, why in the world do companies not learn? So if you look at why these vehicles are recalled or any products recalled, it's the same thing over and over again. How can companies make the same mistake over and over again? Uh, and so there's a whole section on robust design. Uh, Chiguchi was really right on track in, in his uh, how to look at problems. And uh, the ability to say, again, he was looking at the analytic problem. He was an engineer, and uh, he said, um, we have to make products that work in the future. So one of the questions you always ask when you're designing your product is, under what conditions will this not work? No different than under what conditions is the question, the answer true or false. So robust design is a way of thinking about it differently and how you look at the data, how you put conditions out to test it. This is billions of dollars every year by the auto companies, including Toyota. Absolutely robust design. And there's a lot of ways to look at it. Taguchi looked at it one way. There's other ways to looking at it. But the whole idea is to say, under what conditions will this not work? Under what conditions will this not work? Every engineer designing a product that makes anything should ask that. Yes? When, doc, when Dr. Deming was at the companies? Yeah. I will say this. Um, Dr. Deming worked very hard at General Motors, and I know he did at Ford. Bill switched from Ford to GM later and, and took over there. But uh, one of the projects uh, they had Dr. Deming working on was the Cadillac. Uh, Bob Dorn was in charge of that, and uh, they worked on the North Star engine. And uh, it's interesting, it's called the North Star. But, um, Called the North Star. Where's the gentleman I gave my keys to? Yeah. And what did, what's your story about that? The uh, North. You have a North Star engine in your had, car, right? I had a North Star right. engine. And what happened to it yesterday or Friday? The engine would not start. All right. And what's the follow-up story? So I gave him my car so he could go get it fixed because they have to drive back to Michigan today. So here's this uh, Cadillac engine, North Star engine. Here we go. So uh, what happened? Well, uh, yesterday morning, my um, Cadillac, for the first time in 351,000 miles, would not start. It's a Cadillac STS with a North Star engine that Ron informed me Dr. Deming um, worked on. And um, interestingly, the starter is not externally mounted to the engine, but it's actually inside the V of the V8 engine. And you have to remove the intake manifold and the fuel injection system to get at the starter. I called Cadillac Roadside Assistance, and they were very polite. Unfortunately, two hours later, nobody had showed up yet. And the Chevy dealer in Ames that they were going to send the car to for repair made it clear when I called them that they were not prepared to do anything that would get me back on the road. Um, I decided to take matters into my own hands, and I went to the Internet and found a Cadillac dealer in Des Moines 
and they politely told me that uh, they thought they could look at the car if I could get it there. And um, in the process, they said, but there used to be a Cadillac dealer in Ames, and I know somebody there. And so I'm going to call, and sure enough, uh, they found Bill Sullivan at a former Cadillac dealer, and the former Cadillac uh, man, uh, Bill Sullivan is his name, <laughs> said, I've got the parts uh, for all but the starter, and I can do this work because I have people who are trained in it. I have at least two men who are on duty now who can do the work, and I've got the capability of getting a new starter here if that is the problem. And he said, I can get you back on the road this afternoon so you can get back to Michigan. And uh, sure enough, uh, he called me, confirmed that he had a vehicle to come pick me up. He had the parts en route. And uh, at about 4 o'clock yesterday, I was back in my car, and it started perfectly. Now, the really interesting point is this was a Toyota dealer. <laughs> <clears throat> No, I, I know Dr. Deming uh, didn't understand engines very well, <clears throat> even though he's a physicist. He didn't, but I'm sure he asked the engineers the right questions. When will this work? When will it not work? And uh, some interesting questions. So you may know some more history. Beyond. Some of here might know some more history about the North Star engine. But Statistically, should there be any connection between... Uh, if you looked at Toyota's record of recalls, would the statistics show any difference uh, or increase since the federal government has bailed out General Motors and our government is uh, now their competitor in a sense? All those recalls that you had up there from Toyota. Actually, it wasn't very many. <clears throat> Just a few. <laughs> Others have more. No, I don't think so. I don't know. I, I will say this. Uh, Toyota, I, you know, was... Toyota adopted the Deming philosophy when they won the Deming Prize in 1965. So they won the Deming Prize. Deming would visit them a lot. He would contact them. Uh, uh, the CEO, uh, the Toyota family, went to his, some, uh, his um, classes at New York University. <clears throat> uh, they have a picture at their headquarters of Dr. Deming. Uh, he is their philosophy. Um, is, was Diana still? Yeah. Where's Diana? Is she here? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Toyota won the, the Deming Medal in 2003, and um, he, uh, the acceptance speech was basically that we do follow the Deming philosophy ever, ever since uh, we first heard Dr. Deming in 1950. So that is truly a Deming company even today. Now, I'd say they lost a little bit with the CEO, but now I think they're a little bit more back on track. But they're, if you look at their data, uh, I, I would say they're... Um, they're quality record is probably still the best in the world of anyone. They don't lose people. And most importantly, what I think they do is they, they, they never lose knowledge inside the company. They never lose knowledge. So if there is a recall, there's learning that takes place, and it doesn't happen again. They've captured the knowledge. There's a social memory. They keep track of all kinds of things. There's tools in the engineering field that help them do that. They also do a one-page report called an A. I think it's a three of report. Entire project, two years, on one page. It's a piece of art. It captures the whole thing. So you don't have to read through lots of stuff. So they capture the knowledge. So I think the key to being a great company is really using your people and not letting the knowledge uh, go out. Yeah, question. Maybe just one more. I haven't had breakfast yet. Yes, um, I wanted to follow up on the question from the gentleman in the back about special causes of variation when you're using Schuert control charts. I teach a graduate course here in Iowa State for the last 20 years, and I've used the New Economics book and all of that, but I also find your comments about Snedder Kerr Hall appropriate. Um, uh, I know it's very difficult for classical statisticians, as I might call them, to give up on the enumerative versus process control debate. Uh, I just wanted you to comment on the role of common causes, because as I understand it, common causes are the predominant uh, percentage of variation 
relative to special causes. So if you mm -hmm. might comment on that. Well, first of all, <clears throat> one of, the, one of the, the numbers that Dr. Deming would give out in the seminars is 94% uh, of the problems are this, due to the system, not the people. Um, you saw a picture of, um, of um, last night besides Dr. Deming, um, um, Dr. Joseph Duran. He would say 85%. So first of all, problems mostly come from the system. So one way to see where, what, what does that look like, that's the common cause variation. So the idea of separating common and special cause, it's hard to know what what's common cause variation is. It's, it's if you do the cause and effect diagram, it's all of those things on the left side. But there also could be some things on the left side that change. That would be the special causes. The control charts only pick up the special causes. What's left is the common cause. Now, if you don't like the outcome of the common cause, that's called capability. If it's not capable to where you want it, then you have to work on the common cause. How do you do that? Well, control charts won't help you. You've got to go in and make changes to the common cause. Some of the, the uh, causes over here, which we'll call factors and background variables, to see what is the effect on the response variable. So you have to get in and actively run experimentation. That's how you reduce the common cause variation. So I, I think that's, again, where the, the two tools are, are useful. But once you're at common cause variation, then the control charts probably aren't so effective. Now, that's not necessarily true because one of the things that IHI was very insistent on was not to get too sophisticated with statistics. So in all of their work, they, they do annotated run charts. So they basically, they'll look at data over time, and then they'll annotate, here's where we've made our change. And then they look at the after data. So they don't do anything sophisticated, but it still is, it's a basic tool that works. So it's called annotated run chart. So they don't even do control charts. Now some of, and again, what they're doing is actively making changes. The, um, the um, surgical uh, checklist really showed big improvements. Right, so here it is before, here's the number of uh, uh, um, mistakes in surgery before and after. So this still is a very powerful tool. And for people that are working every day, uh, they really can't, they don't have time to look at control charts, experimental design, and so on. But this was a tool that really gave them feedback. And by seeing the data and seeing things get better, it really it was very powerful. So I think that was a lesson for all of us that are more academic, that you really just need to plot data over time. And if you make a change, uh, annotate it, do your plots, do your run charts, uh, make a change, and then decide whether or not the change is an improvement. You might be wrong. But at least you're using your, your own subject matter knowledge to decide. All right, I'm going to let it uh, go from there. So thank you very much. And, uh... Thank you, Ron. Appreciate it.